y'all this morning. Who's hungry for barbecue? <laughs> David Howard came in, he smelled like I could nibble on him a little bit. <laughs> it's going to be delicious. If you don't have tickets, are there any extra tickets? Yes. Yes. You don't even have to worry about it. You can go over there and ask for an extra ticket till they run out. But let's all stand up. We're going to sing together. This is the day. to see you. What a fun way to get things started this morning. Uh, thank you, Deanna. Thank you, choir. I watched the choir back here. The ladies, they were all into all of these motions. <laughs> but the guys, they were a little reluctant. But it doesn't make any difference. They sang out, and that's what counts. Uh, today is a big day. We're getting closer to Easter, and more and more things happening around here, and we're just excited, excited to be part of that. Uh, first of all, at the end of the service today, at about 12.15, uh, the barbecue lunch will be ready, and so you can go over, if you've got tickets, go over and pick them up. If you don't have tickets, they told me this morning they have about 20 tickets uh, that have been returned. So we can accommodate, I think, most everybody that didn't get a ticket, we'll find a way to just, just go over and, and hopefully we'll have tickets for everybody. So we look forward to that. Uh, the youth are really excited about uh, going to camp this summer and this helps them be able to uh, take care of all of the tuition and all of, all of the other expenses lodging and uh, everything else that goes with the, the trip to, to camp. Uh, this evening we'll have all of our services at their regular times. Monday evening 630 our deacons will be meeting. Tuesday or Wednesday we've got prayer meeting team kids and the youth have something special that they're going to be doing this Wednesday. They're going to be doing an, a flashlight Easter egg hunt. So it sounds like a lot of fun, but youth, you've got to bring your own flashlight. So bring your flashlight and be, be prepared to enjoy that. That'll be a lot of fun. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Uh, our choir will be singing next Sunday. Be, be, they'll be doing an Easter cantata to begin the service. So we hope that you will remember that and come and uh, be here to, to enjoy that. And then uh, later, after the service is over, the Central Kids campers are ha having a luncheon. And they have a, a menu. I'm not sure what's on the menu. Ham and potato salad and green beans. And Ham and dressing, green beans, sweet potatoes, a roll, and dessert. There we go, right there. All right, so. All right. So yeah, bring a, bring, just make a donation. There's no charge for the meal. We're not selling tickets or anything. But 
uh, we'll we'll have plenty of good food, and we we'll look forward to uh, look forward to uh, uh, having some help for our Central Kids campus. That's a different camp and a different age group of kids than the youth. So please keep that in mind and pray for them. Uh, pray for the choir as they sing next Sunday. A couple of things on the back of the bulletin. Uh, Vacation Bible School, June the 13th to the 17th. Uh, the theme of Bible School this year is returning to the value of life. And so if you would like to help, we need volunteers. And so there's a place on the board back there for you to sign up if you would like to volunteer. And so we hope that you'll do that. We have to have volunteers to do Bible School. So it's important that, that you sign up to help if you can. Uh, also, uh, East Liberty will be having an adventure camp. Uh, June the 20th through the 24th uh, from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we, can, we have some registration forms on the table in the vestibule. If they run out and you need one, I can email you one. And so if you will let me know about that, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have, those, have those available for you. Uh, I have a thank you card that Mike Hill just brought to me, and I want to read that to you this morning. It says, Your kindness made a difference. And your thoughtfulness touched our hearts. Uh, thank you. Thanks to LaFette Heights Baptist Church for all the prayers and thoughts, Mike and Barbara Hill. So, Mike, we appreciate the remembrance in Barbara. And uh, we uh, know that you're going to miss your brother. But uh, he was a, a big man, made a big imprint everywhere he went. And so uh, I know he's going to continue to, to influence uh, all of our lives, all who knew him, uh, in, a, in a good way. Any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Yeah. Oh, T-shirts. Oh, I'm about to forget that. On the edge of the bulletin, part of that uh, little perforated flap is a Centra Kid T-shirt fundraiser. And this is not just for Centra Kids Camp. This is, for, this is a church T-shirt. And it's got, uh, you can see over there in the E, LHBC. Uh, colors may not be the same because we're having problems with supply chain and they might be there. We're ordering them early, so we're ordering t-shirts in April and we're going to hopefully get them all put together in May and we'll have them in June by the time of Vacation Bible School. Hopefully the colors will be somewhat similar to what, what's represented on that little page, but there may be some variation, uh, some variation in, in the colors, and, but it, it'll all be good. It'll all be good. We'll all have a we'll all have our own T-shirt for the summer. And okay. One more thing. Okay. Uh, Easter eggs. Okay. Easter eggs. Right after the Central Kids lunch next next Sunday, we'll have Easter egg hunt, and for the kids up through sixth grade. So we look forward to that. And so, uh, not only donate, are they. If you want to donate some eggs. If you want to donate some eggs, we we're happy to have those from anybody who wants to bring some eggs. And uh, the kind of eggs we're hunting are are not the uh, authentic uh, chicken laid eggs, but they're chocolate eggs. So if you can put something together like that, we'll be glad to, to help find them. Okay. I have one, Brother Todd. All right, Deanna. It's that time. Y'all heard about it. It's time for dress. So each year, Central Kids and Miss Mindy, they ask for somebody to take a pan and make some dressing. So if you like to make dressing, and it is delicious, or even semi-delicious, we'll take either one. <laughs> um, if you can see me after church and sign up and get one of these pans, it's not a huge pan, it's not a big burden. Uh, Miss Wynell, I don't know if you know it yet, but you're making the gravy for all the dressing. Okay? <laughs> uh, and Miss Mindy said it's $250 a camper to go to Central Kids, and there's 13 of them. So we got to sell a lot of dressing, get a lot of donations. And let's just be honest, parents, it's $250 for a free weekend of babysitting. Send them little kids on. <laughs> so see me after church to get one of these pants. Yeah. Thank you, Deanna. Anybody else with an announcement? Joan. Holy Week is 11th through the 15th at First Baptist Church, noon every day that week. And a part of the Holy Week agenda is that uh, there's about 30-minute worship time at the beginning of the service, and then about uh, 12.30 uh, we go back and eat, eat lunch. And so the church that, where the pastor's preaching, that church will be providing lunch for that day. Our day is Tuesday, the 12th, 
And so I hope that you'll remember that. And we've got a sign-up sheet in the vestibule for crock pots of homemade soup. And so if you have not signed up, we've got about nine, I think, that have signed up. We probably need about, uh, about three more uh, in order to be able to, to feel confident that we're going to be able to feed everybody. So if you have not signed up for a crock pot of soup and you'd be willing to make one, uh, please sign your name on that list going out the door. And also there's a sign up for cornbread and for a dessert. So any of those items that you would bring, if you don't, feel, uh, you don't, want, to, don't, don't want to do soup, you can bring a dessert, that would be fine. And so just look back on that list and, and sign up for those things. Right. Just come to the back door, come in the back parking lot, come in the back door. The kitchen will be the first door on the right as you come in through there. And there uh, should be somebody there who can uh, take your crock pot and get it, and get, get it in, in location. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.
Why were, why were y'all why were y'all looking at me like that? I know. That was weird, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that was weird. Okay. Everybody out there was weirding out too. Okay. Yeah, that was just weird. Now, I did, I want you to know I did that on purpose, but that was weird. You know why that was weird? Because every Sunday, I am so glad to see you. And I always speak to you as you come up here. And then I hug you. And then I give you a lesson because I love you. And I want you to know more about Jesus. Now look, here's the lesson for today. I hope that the way I ignored you made you feel a little bit bad. Because I want you to know that sometimes I think we do the same thing to God. Okay? We are guilty of doing the same thing to God. Did you know that we will go days that we don't even pray? Have you seen Lindsay? I haven't. Where is she? Oh, uh, I don't know. Does anybody know where Clancy is? She's in the choir. Oh, she's in the choir. Just sit right here for right now, Maddox, okay? That'd be good. Sit right here in front of Miss Donna. That'll be good. Back to the lesson. Look, you can. Do you know that we will go days that we don't even talk to God? We ignore Him. Just like I ignored y'all when you first came up here. We ignore God. We, we act like he's not even there. God wants us to talk to him every day. And what do we call that? Praying. Praying. Thank you, Andy. He loved us so much that he gave his son Jesus to die for our sins. And he wants a relationship with us. He wants us to pray and read our Bibles and talk to him every day. Now, when we don't do that... God is being ignored. Just like I ignored you when you came up here today. We ignore God. God does not want to be ignored. Okay? He wants us to come to Him every day. So let's remember to give God the time that He deserves in our lives and not to ignore God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Please forgive us for not giving you the time in our lives that you deserve. Help us to be thankful for the love you've shown us and help us to never ignore you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, kids, wait a minute, Melody. Look, let's sit on the front for just a minute before we...
Maybe y'all notice we don't have enough room up here. I don't know what we can do about it. But anyway, it's great to see you this morning. You know, nothing in life is more satisfying than knowing that you have completed a mission, that you've completed a task, something, that, something that's difficult to do, but you have stuck with it, and you've seen it through, and you've completed it. Now, there's nothing more satisfying than to be able to say, mission accomplished. If you finished college, you know how that felt that last day when you walked out of that last class, you finished that last test, and you know how, what that felt like. Or if you were in the Army and you went through boot camp, you know what it was like when you finished boot camp and, and that was behind you. You knew how that felt. If you have raised children to maturity without them killing each other, uh, then, you know, then you know how it felt. And you may have thought, you know, it's done, it's over. You may have even actually said, it is finished. But when you said it, it didn't change the world. When you said it, it didn't even make the newspapers. But there are certain days in life that we just can't forget. They are red-letter days. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, he said one word in the Greek language, which translates to three words in English, and it changed everything. And that one word has the potential of changing every person in this building today and changing you forever. Uh, we're in a series of messages that we've been calling the bucket list. Uh, everybody's got a bucket list. Uh, you know, if your doctor told you that uh, in the next year you were going to die, that you had a disease and it was making progression and in the course of the next year you would, you would pass away. If you had heard that from him, there would probably be a lot of things that would come to your mind. You would think about some of the things that you wanted to do, but you haven't had a chance to do. You'd think about some of the things, places maybe you wanted to go and see some things, and you haven't been able to do that. Or maybe some things that you wanted to experience that you've never gotten to experience. So there's certain things, we all know this, uh, we've all said it at one time or another. We've said, hey, before I die, I want to do this. Before I die, I want to go there. Before I die, I want to see this. There are a lot of things we may want to accomplish before we die. But in this series of messages, we've been talking about seven, th seven things that we had better do before we die. Uh, as a matter of fact, these seven things, if you don't deal with before you die, you're not ready to die. Uh, these seven things are not my idea. Now, they come from Jesus. These are the seven statements that Jesus made on the cross in the last six hours of his life as he hung on the cross. And so he said there are seven things that I'm going to make sure as the Son of God that I check off my list before I check out of this life. And one of those things we had better make sure that we have done before we die, uh, we had better be able to say, mission accomplished. God gave me a mission and I want to make sure that I accomplish that mission before I leave this earth. So before we uh, read these words from John chapter 19, I want to tell you what's going on here. Jesus has been hanging on the cross for six hours. Uh, for six hours, he's been the victim, not the victor. 
but he's been the victim of the sins of the entire world. Now, let me put it to you this way. For six hours, Jesus has been climbing a mountain. And that mountain is the Mount Everest of sin. Because all of the sins of the entire world, my sins, your sins, the sins of the world, were all placed upon Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is dying because of those sins, and he's dying suffering because of those sins. Uh, he finally reached the top of that mountain. And when he reached the top of the mountain, he planted a flag of forgiveness in the shape of a cross at the top of that mountain and died for our sins, paid the price for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. Uh, in the final seconds of his life, this is what the Bible records that he said. This is John chapter 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Now in the Greek, uh, that is one word. It's the word to telestai. That translates into English three words, it is finished. For six hours, uh, Jesus had suffered. He had been nailed to the cross. He had been scourged with a whip. And now for six hours, uh, he's been working. Uh, he's been worked over, and now his work is almost over. He dies with mission accomplished. So in those words, and at that moment, just before he took his last breath, he shares some things that we had better make sure that we have finished in our life before we are finished with life. Now, I don't know exactly what those are, uh, but Jesus and the Word of God tells us what those things are. There are three things that we need to finish in life before we are finished with life. And so here's the first thing that you'd better make sure we finish. Finish your walk with God. Now, I know something that is true of everybody who is listening to me right now. And it's true of me, if you were to die right now, you would leave behind some unfinished business. Some things that you hoped and thought that you would be able to complete, but yet death interrupted your plans. And so you died with unfinished business. If I died right now, I would die with some unfinished business. I mean, we all would. As a matter of fact, if the world ended today, we would see unfinished business everywhere. Uh, I want to give you an illustration uh, about uh, something you may all be familiar with. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about Mount Rushmore. We actually got to go, Donna and I did, and Beth and David when they were younger. Uh, we decided for vacation one year we were going to make a tour of the country. And so we went out west. We went to the Grand Canyon. We went north from there to Yellowstone and then we turned and went back east and went through Montana and got into South Dakota and had not really planned to go to Mount Rushmore, but we saw it from the interstate. And so we said we need to go and see this uh, while we're in this area. And so we learned some things about Mount Rushmore. We learned that the sculptor of this was a man by the name of Gutzon Borglum. And he uh, sculpted these four, four faces of American presidents into the side of that mountain. But I learned that he never finished his work. When you look at those faces on the mountain, you see them basically from the collar up. Uh, his plan was to scope, uh, to sculpt them from the, all the way down to the waist. Uh, but that was his plan, but he died. And he never finished his plan. He never finished the work that he had mapped out and he had sketched out that was his plan to complete. Uh, when I heard that, I thought about people who go there and watch this, and they never realize that they're looking at unfinished business. They're looking at this man who had a plan. He got the faces done, and it's great because that's a great attraction. It's just amazing to, to look at that and to know that that's carved out of a mountain face. But he didn't get to do all that he intended to do and all that he wanted to do. So I want to ask you the question, what, if, what would happen to you if you left planet Earth today? What would you leave unfinished? A book half read, a letter half written, an apology never given, a bill not paid, promises not kept. We all have things that we have are, are unfinished in our life. And one day we're going to leave this world, and I know something. Uh, I know that uh, I'll never read all of the books I want to read. In my office library, I have hundreds of books on shelves on the wall. And I have read some of them. I have read some in most all of them. But there are books there that I have not read, and that's my plan. I want to read those books. 
But I realize that if I had to leave this world today, there would be books that would be left uh, unread. And we're all going to leave that way. We're all going to leave with places that we want to go that we didn't find time and we didn't find the, the means to be able to go, to go there, things we wanted to do that we didn't get to do. In fact, there's only one person in all of the history of this world who actually died with no unfinished business, and that was Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is the only one who can say, and I mean from A to Z, he's the only one who can say, that it is finished. So how did he do that? From the time that he was born to the time that he died, he followed the path that God laid out for him to walk. And he walked it to the very last step of his journey. Now, here's the good news. God has laid out a path for every one of us. He has a path for you. He has a path for me. And we, we are to walk that path until we get to the last step of our journey. God has a path he wants us to walk, and we don't have to wonder what that path is because the Bible tells us something about that path. One of the things that the Bible says about that path is in the most famous psalm uh, in the Bible, and that's Psalms 23. Uh, he says in verse 3, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And that's exactly the path that God wants all of us to walk. Uh, he says, Paul, I want you to walk a right path. A righteous path. I want you to follow this path of righteousness. And I want you to stay on that path until that path runs out. Now, let me just be honest with you. If you walk God's path, it's going to lead you to different places. Sometimes it's going to lead you to success. Sometimes it's going to lead you to sacrifice. And sometimes it's going to lead you to suffering. And don't let that path su surprise you or those facts surprise you because uh, the path that Jesus walked was paved with suffering and sacrifice. Uh, I mean, think about the suffering that Jesus had to undergo in his life. Uh, there was the social suffering of being rejected by his own family and by his own people, the Jewish nation. They rejected him, and they were the ones who were responsible for putting him on the cross. Just think about the social suffering that he endured as he, he dealt with the rejection of those who should have welcomed him with open arms. But they did not. And then there was the physical suffering of the crucifixion. The crucifixion was the cruelest means of execution that has ever been devised by man. Uh, no means of the means of execution that are used in, in modern times are so, so mild in, in comparison to this because it's just, just suffering from beginning to end, untold suffering. And then there was the spiritual suffering, which was the greatest of all, when he took the sins of the world on him, he who knew no sin, who, he was pure, who had never sinned, and yet he became sin. And, and the sins that he carried on the cross was not his sins, it was our sins. And so he suffered in that way. So we all have a path to, to climb. We all have a path to walk. Sometimes it's rocky. Sometimes it's smooth. Sometimes it's uphill. Sometimes it's downhill. Uh, sometimes it may seem easy. And other times it seems very hard. But from the time that Jesus was born until the time that Jesus died, he walked the path of righteousness. He always walked in the right direction. He always walked to the right places. He always walked in the right way. Right way. He always walked with the right heart. He always walked in paths of righteousness. I know that there are a lot of things that I'm never going to finish. But there are some things that I want to finish when I die. I want to finish a faithful marriage. I've been married to this woman for 50 years. And Donna, I've been faithful to you for 50 years. And I want to be faithful to you until I die. So that's one thing that I want to accomplish. And then I want to finish a, fr a fruitful ministry. Uh, I know I'm not always going to be the pastor of this church. I know that and you know that. Uh, but I want you to know this. I never planned to get out of ministry. I may not be pastoring a church. I may not be able to preach uh, on Sundays. But I want to be doing ministry. And so regardless of where I am and what my state in life is, I want to be doing something to serve the Lord. And I want that ministry to be fruitful. And then uh, I want to finish with a fulfilled mission. Uh, I know I'm not going to accomplish everything I wanted to. I realize that now. 
I look at my age, I look at where I am in life, and I realize that there are, there are limited things that are ahead of me that I can accomplish. But I want to accomplish not my plan, but I want to accomplish God's plan for my life. I want to be, make sure that I have done everything that God wants me to do. So I just made up my mind, I'm going to stay on the path. I'm going to continue to do what, what God gives me the opportunity to do. And God's given me a path of righteousness to walk. And I want to walk that path until it runs out. So I, that's, that's what I've made up my mind to do. Second thing this morning, uh, I want to finish the will of God. Not just walk with God, but I want to finish the will of God. Uh, now let me ask you a question. When you read those words, it is finished, the question is, what is the it? He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What if I walked up to you today and I said, hey, by the way, it's finished. What would you, how would you respond? Uh, would you say, well, uh, great. Wh what is it? What, I what, is, what is it that's finished? What did Jesus mean? What did he finish on the cross? Uh, we don't have to wonder because he tells us in two different places uh, what he finished. In John 4.34, Jesus said this. He kind of put this in an interesting way. He said, my food. You know, that's... That's, what, that's the basics of life. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you know what Jesus was saying on the cross when he said, it is finished? He was saying, I have finished the will of God. I have finished God's calling on my life, what he sent me here to do. Uh, Jesus had one thing to do, and that was to finish God's will in his life. Uh, when we die, here's the question. Did we do our will, or did we do his will? Uh, did we finish what we wanted to do or what God wanted us to do, according to our will or his will? You remember the words that Jesus said to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus' will was to do his father's will no matter. No matter what the cost, no matter how steep the climb, no matter how great the sacrifice, no matter how hurtful the pain, because the one thing that mattered to Jesus was the will of God and to finish God's will. It was God's will for Jesus to save his people from their sins and to save all of those who by faith would put their trust in him. It was God, his purpose to die for our sins so that we might be saved. And it's God's will for him to die on that cross in order to pay for those sins. And he did that. Now, I guarantee you this. When Jesus cried out on the cross that afternoon and he said, it is finished, uh, I'm sure that there were some who were standing around about that cross and heard him say that. And they thought, well, that's a cry of defeat. He's giving up. He's been whipped. The Romans have beat him. Uh, the Pharisees have conquered him. And so now he's dying on that cross. And I'm sure if the Pharisees were staying around that cross and they were listening to what he said and, he, and they were saying, you know, you better believe you're finished. Uh, they were saying, we don't have to put up with this Galilean troublemaker anymore. We've nailed him on the cross and his life is gone. And so we have won this battle. The Romans thought he was finished because they saw him as a pretender to the throne of Caesar. And so they said, we don't have to worry about him anymore. Uh, he, he's been put down for good. Even the disciples thought that he was finished. And they said it was a good run, and it was fun while it lasted, but uh, we have, we, it's, it's over, and we'll, we'll miss him. Uh, but they were wrong, because Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Uh, Jesus didn't say, well, I, I gave it my best shot, but I failed. Jesus said, I've done everything that God has called me to do, and I have been successful. You know, the world has corrupted our definition of success. Uh, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Success is not defined by Wall Street. Success is not defined by Hollywood. It's not defined by Washington, D.C. It's God who defines success. And here's what success is. Success is finding and fulfilling the will of God for your life. That's what success is. It's doing what God put you here to do. Uh, when Jesus said it is finished, he didn't mean he was finished. 
Because in reality, he was just getting started. When you finish your walk with God and you finish the will of God, then the third thing is you finish the work of God. Now, I want you to listen to this. Just before Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying in that garden. And his prayer is recorded in the 17th chapter of the book of John. And in that prayer, it was the longest prayer that's ever recorded that Jesus prayed. And I know that the Bible says that he prayed all night on some occasions. But this is the longest prayer in John 17, the longest prayer of Jesus that's, that's recorded. And in this prayer, in the middle of that prayer, here's what he said. John 17, 4, he's talking to God and he said, I have brought you glory on earth. Now that ought to be what we all want to do. We all want to bring God glory. We were put here to glorify God, right? That's our purpose in creation. We were put here that God would be glorified through us. So here's how you do it. We, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And by the way, he uses the same word there that he used on the cross. One word in English, three, uh, one word in Greek, and three words in English. To telestai, uh, it is finished. God had given Jesus a work that only Jesus could do, and Jesus did it. Uh, only he could redeem us. Only Jesus could pay for our sins. Only he could satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Only he could save his people from their sins. And Jesus says, Father, I finished my walk with you. I have done your will. I finished your will for me. And I have finished the work that you have given me to do. Now let me tell you something about that Greek word. It's one of the greatest words in all of the Bible. It was a word that in Jesus' day was used both in legal circles and in financial circles, the word to telestai. When a person owed a debt and that debt was paid, they would stamp the word to telestai on it. And that meant it's paid, it's finished. It's been, it's been take, it's, everything's been taken care of. So it's, it's like, like we would stamp something paid in full. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans would stamp to telestai on that bill. And that meant that it had been paid in full. It was also important for legal reasons. Uh, if you were brought before a Roman judge and you had been in charge of a crime and you were tried, you, you heard that, the, that Roman judge heard your case, and if he found you guilty, that judge would prescribe a sentence and he would write out what was called a certificate of death, of debt. And on one side of that piece of paper, he would write down the crime that you had been charged with, what you had, what you had done and what you had been found guilty of. And then on the other side of the paper, he would write the punishment. He would write, this is what this person has to pay. This is the time he has to serve. This is the fine that he has to pay. And so that was the certificate of debt. Uh, and when a person went to jail, they would take that certificate of debt and they would nail that on the door of the cell. And anybody passing by could look at that and they could tell who was in that cell, what he, what he had done, why he was in there, and what his cost of what his fine was, that if it was a fine, and, and not, not just time, if it was a fine that could be paid, they could know what that was. And so uh, that he would be able to be out uh, of prison. So when that man had done that, they would take that certificate of debt, and they would take it to the judge, and the judge would certify that the debt had been paid, and he would stamp the word to telestai on that page, and that would mean that the debt had been paid. And then that certificate of debt would be given to the person who had served the time, who had paid the debt, and he would carry it with him so that if there was ever a question and ever a challenge to why he's out on the street and why he's free, he would be able to produce that paper where the judge had said to Telestai, that debt has been satisfied. And so he was free to go, never to be tried for that crime again. So that's what Jesus meant when he said, it is finished. He was saying, Father, the debt of this world, the sin debt of this world has been paid. It is finished. It has been paid for. Uh, and so uh, every sin that's ever been committed by every person who ever lived, every sin Jesus died for, Jesus paid for. The only thing that remains is for us to accept what Christ did for us. We have to accept the price that Jesus paid uh, something that's interesting here, uh, in the Greek language, the tense of verbs are very important. Uh, not so much in English, but in Greek, uh, it's very important. If you read a verb in Greek and it's in the past tense, uh, that's just like uh, we, we would use it. It means something happened. Something has happened. But this verse is not just in the past tense, it's in the perfect tense. So it's past perfect. 
And that's the most powerful tense in the Greek language. Uh, the perfect tense speaks of, speaks of an action that has been completed in the past, but its effect carries forward into the present and will continue to carry forward uh, into the future. Uh, the past tense says, this happened. The perfect tense says, this happened, and it's still in effect today, and it will be tomorrow. So in other words, what Jesus was saying, he didn't just say, it is finished, and it's done. What he was saying, it is finished today, and it will always be finished tomorrow. It will be finished forevermore, absolutely and forever. So what happened yesterday is still in effect today. It's got value today. Uh, so if you think of any fault that you have, if you think of any shortcoming that you have, any sin that you have committed, when you give your life to Jesus at that moment, Jesus Christ stamps over the door of your heart to tell us that. It is finished. It is paid in full. And so when Jesus forgives our sins, our sins are forgiven forever. Uh, that means every sin that you have ever committed. It means every sin that you may commit. It means every sin that you ever will commit. It. Listen, when Jesus Christ died for your sins, you hadn't even committed him yet. I mean, it was all in the future, but he died for that. He died for all of our sins, our past sins, our present sins, our future sins. He died for them. If on the cross Jesus paid in full, that means we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to pay anything else. In fact, we can't pay anything else. I mean, what could we pay? What could we add to the price that Jesus paid? He paid with his life. He paid with his blood. What could we add to that? What could we do? Uh, that would ev even be able to be on the same scale, on the same level as what Jesus Christ did for us. We can't pay anything else. So this one word means that salvation and forgiveness and eternal life are a gift. They're all free gifts. So this is what people don't uh, understand. And I know, I know why it's hard to grasp, because the average person thinks, I've got to do something to earn my salvation. Uh, I've got to do something to merit God's forgiveness. I've got to do something to be worthy of eternal life. Listen to me. Read my lips. God is not trying to sell you forgiveness. It's not for sale. It's a free gift. He offers it to all who will receive it. He's not trying to sell you forgiveness. He's not offering forgiveness at a discount. When it comes to forgiveness, there's no such thing as a blue light special. Uh, there's no such thing as a half price sale. You can't split the cost. You can't, I mean, there's no down payment. There's no installment payments. There's not even interest to be charged uh, to your sins being forgiven. Salvation is being offered. Your soul is being cleansed. And Jesus said, it is finished. And since it's a finished work, you can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. You can't substitute anything for it. It's, it's finished. It's done. The greatest life that ever was lived died the greatest death that was ever, has ever died, and it has finished the greatest work ever given. And this is the beautiful thing about it. Jesus uttered that one simple word in Greek, to telestai, and that translates into three words in English, it is finished. And here's what he was saying to us. He was saying it's closing time. He's saying, now I can turn out the lights. Now I can lock the door behind me because I have finished the work that God gave me to do. It's done. Now here's the thing. God has given all of us work that he wants us to do. And we should finish that work until the time comes that God is finished with us. But Jesus finished his work. I don't know how much you know about the Old Testament tabernacle, but it's a very interesting study because it's filled with symbolism and so many pictures of what Christ has done for us, and those things were all future at that time uh, because he'd not been to the cross at that point in, in, in history. But uh, it's a fascinating study just to go, go back and look at the tabernacle and see how it was built. You know who the architect of the tabernacle is? God. God is the architect. God is the one who designed it. Uh, and so he was so concerned that when the Moses and the Jews, when they built that tabernacle, he was so concerned that it was right uh, that he gave specific instructions, exact instructions about how it was to be done. 
everything about it. There was no, nothing left uh, for the workman to be able to decide, well, I'll do it this way because God just says this is how, uh, how it's to be done. And he says, I'm not going to leave this to anyone else because this is exactly how I want it to be built. I want it to be built according to these dimensions. I want these colors used in the tapestries. This is what I want in this, this tab tabernacle. And he even gave the dimensions of the furniture uh, that was put in the tabernacle. And he says, I want uh, all of this, this, not just this is what I want, but he even specified where he wanted them to go. Somewhere in the holy place, somewhere in the holy of holies, somewhere in the outer court. But he gave specific instructions about everything. And the fascinating thing about it, you read this list of furniture, and there are about a, 10 or 12 pieces of furniture that are specifically listed that are there. But there's something that's missing. There's not a chair. There are tables. There are lampstands. Uh, there are uh, lavers to wash your hands but not a chair to sit in. Why was that? Why was there not a chair uh, that was there? Because the priest in the Old Testament could never sit down. His work did not end. It was a continual work that he did over and over, 24-7. They worked in shifts, and so you had a day shift, and then you had a night shift, and so people were continually bringing sacrifices to the temple, and so the priest was handling those sacrifices as they, as they brought in, but he could never sit down because there was always another sacrifice to make. There was always another lamb to be slain. There was always, always somebody else who uh, needed to be forgiven. And so the priests worked 24 hours around the clock. Uh, they never got to sit down because their work was never done. Now, Jesus Christ is the great high priest. He is, the, he is our high priest. And so when Jesus Christ came, there was a change that the Bible tells us. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it tells us that when this priest, that's Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God because his work was finished. His work was finished. It didn't have to be repeated uh, again and again and again because he prayed one time, one sacrifice for all time, and that work was completed. So I close with this. I don't know where you watched the Winter Olympics. They were on about a month ago. Uh, I really don't get too worked up over Winter Olympics because it all deals with ice and snow. And I didn't grow up with ice and snow, and so you know, curling and ice hockey and things like that. I really don't know anything about that. Uh, sometimes I'll watch it just out of amusement, but I really don't get into that, and I don't really root for anybody except the flag that they have on their their back. Uh, and then the Summer Olympics are a little different because I can identify with what's going on with the Summer Olympics, and so I get excited about, about that. But uh, I was reading about the Olympics and about the beginning of the Olympics. You know, the Olympics go back to hundreds of years before Christ. Uh, and then the Olympics were stopped, and for several centuries there were, there were no Olympics. And then in 1896, the modern Olympics were restarted. But this story goes back to the early Olympics in, in 564 B.C. And uh, it deals with a wrestling match. Uh, actually, wrestling is a mild description of what they did. It was called pancreton. Uh, we got something like that today. Uh, pancreton, we call it WWE, WWF, uh, MMA. That's, that's what it would be today. And, you know, like a cage fight, you fight till you can't fight anymore, and they have to just rake your body out. And so this is how this pancreton thing went. And so uh, the pancreton event was part boxing, it was part wrestling, but it was a fight to the finish. And so uh, these people were in, in the, this cage, and they were fighting. And a man by the name of Arichion, uh, was he had, he had won this event three years in a row. And he was competing again it, uh, in it again. And so uh, as he's competing in this, his opponent manages to get his arm around his neck. And as he is tightening his grip around his neck, he's suffocating Arichion. Arichion. And so he's about to lose consciousness. And then at the last moment, in a desperate attempt to break this chokehold, he is able to reach his opponent's ankle. And so with his bare hands, he takes the opponent's ankle 
and he actually pulls that foot, that ankle, out of joint. And the pain is so severe that the man who's got a reach on and a chokehold immediately, uh, I mean, he immediately puts up his hand. He gives up. He, he concedes the match. And so uh, the process of what happened, Orichion had been strangled, and he died of asphyxiation. Even, after, even while his opponent was surrendering, he died because of asphyxiation. And so the judges had to make a decision. They had to get together and decide who won this match, the man who put up his hand and lived, or the man who didn't surrender, and yet he died. And so they finally decided that Arichion was the one who won this wrestling match. Uh, he won uh, because he never surrendered. His opponent surrendered, and even though Arichion died, he was the, declared the winner of this match. Arichion is the only Olympic champion in history who ever won the victory by dying. Now, I say that to say this. Uh, 2,000 years ago, sin nailed Jesus Christ to a cross. And death got Jesus in a stranglehold. And sin and death looked at Jesus and said, You are finished. But Jesus took the sting out of death. And Jesus looked at sin and death and he said, I'm not finished. You're finished. It's finished now and forevermore. And what Jesus did in the last minutes of his life, we can do as well. So we want to make sure that when our life is over, that we can look up to a Father who loves us and called us, and we can say, Father, I have finished the walk, I have finished your will for my life, and I have finished your work. And you can say, mission accomplished. Let's pray as we close the service for this morning. And I just want you just for a moment, while we're sitting here, no no moving around, just everybody just be patient for just a moment. And the reason I say that is because for some of you this may be the most important time in your life. Because you need to finish something that life uh, is, before life is finished with you, you need to finish your relationship with God. You need to nail that relationship down. You need to decide once and for all who the Savior is and that He is your Savior and He is your Lord. And so you can do that, acknowledging that and accepting what Christ did for you on the cross and asking for your salvation. You can do that with a simple prayer. And I promise you that if every person in this building prays this prayer at one, one time, God hears it as if it's just you in his presence. God hears the thoughts in your heart and in your mind, and he hears your prayers. He hears the prayers of the whole world prayed simultaneously. He's able to discern your prayers, and so he's listening for your prayer. So you can just pray something, something like this. You can just say, Lord, I owe a debt, and I can't pay it. I owe the debt of sin. I'm a, I'm a sinner. I'm guilty of sin, and I'll never pay that off. So, God, I'm asking you today to take that debt and to forgive me of that. And I ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm trusting you as my Savior. I'm receiving you as my Lord. And I'm giving you all that I am for you to use in any way that you need to. I want to be yours, and I want to be your servant. I b believe that your death, your burial, and your resurrection paid for my sins. And I accept that payment today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to, to let me know that you've prayed that prayer, that you've asked Christ into your heart, and that you want to follow him. So we're going to stand and sing an invitation hymn, and it's an opportunity for you to respond and to say, I've prayed that prayer, and I want to follow Jesus. So if we stand and sing, if God is speaking to you, we invite you to come.
we're going to sing the chorus of He Lives. They can come and sing at the same time. Oh, yes, the blessing, Brother Paul. The blessing. Come on as we sing and welcome John. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. Thank you. 